Uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to start with just a very brief introduction to the process before we get into discussing the actual guidelines uh, that are going to be published this week. The American Academy of Neurology has a process that's part of the Quality Standards Subcommittee in which it's charged with generating conclusions and recommendations on the use of various treatments and technologies in neurologic diseases. The process is arduous and rigorous in which we are charged with reviewing the world's medical literature in a particular subject and culling from that literature the highest quality clinical trials that ultimately can lead to these conclusions and recommendations. And for example, as many of you know, the randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study is considered the gold standard of a rigorous clinical trial, and it's often termed a class one study. We tend to look at class one and class two as the highest level studies, and tend not to look at open label anecdotal case series, which have less reliability to reach these conclusions. We initially published a set of these guidelines concerning botulinum toxin in neurological diseases back in 2008. And we reviewed the use of four formulations of botulinum toxin back then as well as now with an important difference being that in 2008 we reviewed the four US FDA approved formulations of botulinum toxin as a class and generated a single set of conclusions concerning all four of them with all the data essentially combined together. We took a different approach in this update in that we now have looked at each of the four formulations individually and have looked at the data and the evidence for each toxin on its own and generated <clears throat> conclusions for each of those toxins separately. The four toxins, just to remind you, are three formulations of botulinum toxin A and one formulation of botulinum toxin type B. The names go like this. There are generic names essentially assigned by the FDA, and then there are brand names which many of us are familiar with in daily use. The four, type, the four types are as follows. Type A includes onobotulinum toxin A, also known as Botox, abobotulinum toxin A, known as Dysport, incobotulinum toxin A, which is Xeomin, and finally Rima botulinum toxin B, which is myoblock in the US, neuroblock in Europe. We reviewed four diseases that we'll discuss in a moment. Mark Hallett will discuss cervical dystonia and blepharospasm, and then I will come back and finish up with the discussion of adult spasticity and headache with a focus on chronic migraine. So I'll now turn it over to Dr. Hallett to continue the discussion. <clears throat> All right, thank you, David. Good afternoon. Uh, there are many different types of dystonia. Uh, the most common ones are the adult onset focal dystonia, where there is affection of a particular body part. And the two most common ones are blepharospasm, involvement of the eye, and cervical dystonia, involvement of the neck. And it's for these two where the evidence has increased in between the time that we did the 2008 guideline and now, and the reason, therefore, that we have them in the update. Uh, and as uh, David mentioned already, uh, we had considered uh, the four types as a, a single class before, and now we look at the evidence individually. So in relation to blepharospasm, uh, it is one of the uh, first indications that the FDA had for uh, botulinum neurotoxin. So it's, it's been around a very long time for this particular entity. And uh, at the time uh, of the 2008 guideline, we gave a level B uh, level um, for blepharospasm. And now, looking at the agents individually, there is level B, that is moderate evidence for probably 
effective for ONA botulinum neurotoxin A and for INCO botulinum toxin A. And weak evidence, level C, that is possibly effective for ABO botulinum uh, neurotoxin A. In relation to uh, uh, RIMA botulinum neurotoxin B, uh, there isn't any evidence, so we don't have any comment uh, on it. Now, in relation to the three uh, toxins uh, of type A, uh, there is also some information in relation to relative equivalence of them. And of course, there is a fair amount of clinical use of them. And uh, for, uh, for uh, thinking about the way that we should comment on these uh, formal guidelines, we feel that there should be something called uh, clinical relevance or clinical usage of these different agents. And we feel that, uh, that the three level, that, that the three types of A are uh, all very useful for the treatment of blepharospasm and are relatively equivalent. In relation to cervical dystonia, uh, in the past as a class, uh, there was level A, that is strong evidence for uh, the use in cervical dystonia. And now, uh, looking at them individually, there is strong evidence level A for abobotulinum neurotoxin A and rimabotulinum neurotoxin B, and only moderate evidence level B for onobotulinum neurotoxin A and Inca inco neurobotulinum toxin A are probably effective at uh, level B. Once again, in terms of clinical context uh, and uh, studies that look at bioequivalence or medical equivalence between them, there is fair evidence that they look relatively similar in, in terms of their clinical benefit. But uh, the guidelines formally have to review the evidence, and this is uh, what I was saying, is what the level of evidence actually is for the individual classes. So that's where we stand with the focal dystonias, and now I'll turn it back to Dr. Simpson to deal with the other two entities. Thank you, Mark. To continue with spasticity, uh, back in 2008, we reviewed spasticity both in adults as well as children. And in this current guideline, we restricted the review to adult spasticity, partly because the American Academy of Neurology has published separate guidelines in the past several years on childhood spasticity. To remind you what spasticity is, this is a disorder often following various types of brain or spinal cord injury, resulting in muscle stiffness and tightness, interfering with movement and function. One sees spasticity after stroke, traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, MS, and many other disorders. We broke the spasticity analysis into several different groups. The first one, of course, was upper limb versus lower limb. And one will find different clinical trials relating to each. To start with the upper limb, back in 2008, Generically, as a class, botulinum toxin was found to have strong evidence for efficacy. In this guideline, as we've broken out each of the individual toxins, we found the following for upper limb spasticity. All three of the type A botulinum toxins, that is ONA, ABO, and INCO, Botox, Dysport, and Xeomin, reached a level A the highest level of proven effectiveness, and thus were recommended to be offered in this disorder. RIMA, type B, or myoblock, had a level B support. That is moderate evidence because of lesser clinical trials available. Now importantly, when one looks at the type of function that improved in these patients with spasticity, it related to what is known as passive functional gains. These are things we do for the patient, help them to dress, help to get braces on them, to transfer, patient's pain or posture. On the other hand, what is called active function, 
the ability of patients to do things for themselves, like reaching and dressing and buttoning, has been much more difficult to prove in clinical trials. And in fact, that wasn't proven in these studies. If one now goes to the lower limb, what the data showed was level A support, strong evidence for efficacy for two of the type A's. That is ABO, botulinum toxin, or dysport, and onobotulinum toxin, or Botox. There is insufficient evidence in the lower limb for either INCO or REMA. Now, one other point about spasticity is we reviewed comparative studies, not only between botulinum toxins, but comparing botulinum toxin to oral therapy. And one of the most commonly used oral treatments for spasticity is known as tizanidine. And there was a level B study published showing that botulinum toxin A, or ONA, was superior to tizanidine in upper limb spasticity, both on efficacy in reducing tone, as well as safety in terms of side effects. Now let me finish by moving to the last disorder we reviewed, and that's headache. Here there was a major difference between the 2008 guidelines and 2016. In 2008, the data available for virtually all types of headache with botulinum toxin did not support any ability to conclude efficacy, including migraine. Since that time, there have been two pivotal class one studies published for onobotulinum toxin A, or Botox, in the treatment of a specific type of migraine, which is chronic migraine. And this is defined as having 15 or more headache days per month. And in that disorder, these clinical trials, the class one studies, demonstrated efficacy and in fact resulted in an FDA approval for onobotulinum toxin <clears throat> in the treatment of chronic migraine. Now it's important to qualify that the magnitude of the efficacy was small. That is, there was an approximately 15% reduction in headache days per month comparing the active onobotulinum toxin to placebo. However, that did reach statistical significance and, as I mentioned, resulted in a class A uh, or level A recommendation. There was also level B evidence, moderate evidence, for improvement of health-related quality of life with onobotulinum toxin A in the treatment of chronic migraine. When one looks at other forms of headache, including episodic migraine, that is, headaches less than 15 days per month, in fact, there's a very different conclusion. There is level A strong evidence indicating lack of effectiveness of onobotulinum toxin A in episodic migraine. In another form of headache, tension-type headache, there is moderate level B evidence, again, against any efficacy of botulinum toxin in the treatment of tension-type headaches.